Tillo, what's pop? We are on Twitch, we are not live, but you can leave a like, comment, subscribe, turn on your post notification bells. Let's continue to grow the family from Chicago to the UK. Um, don't forget, if we do go live and you happen to miss the live and you want to catch up on previously recorded lives or be ready for the next group of lives, you see it at the bottom of the screen. Twitch.com, head to the lit one. Um, let's get into this, man. This is Lost and Pond. Let me sub up, first and foremost. Hit the like button. Six British things that are actually American. I feel like this is giving me an opportunity to just get negative. And y'all gonna be mad. Let's get into it. Copyright disclaimer under Section 107 of the Copyright Act 1976. Allowance is made for fair use for purposes such as criticism, comment, news reporting, teaching, scholarship, and research. Fair use is a use permitted by copyright statute that might otherwise be infringing. Nonprofit, educational, or personal use tips the balance in favor of fair use. No copyright infringement intended. All rights belong to their respective owners. You get me. Hello, I'm Lawrence and I'm on a quest to uncover all of the memos that Britain and America lost in the pond and one of those memos pertains to things and stuff, specifically things and stuff that are widely synonymous with one country but unbeknownst to most of us were invented in the other. Really? <coughs> There's a lot of things that I use that I, I, I just expect the British people to have invented because I've never heard like a kettle. Like who, like who, you know what I'm saying? Kettle. Never, never heard of it. Today, we're going to look at six one. British things that, against all odds, are actually American. And you might be wondering, Lawrence, you're British. Why would you choose to show up your country in favour of the United States? Well, firstly, you hypothetical person, my official nationality is British American. And secondly, I recently gave Britain its due in the much-heralded video, Six American Things That Are Actually British. I'll link to... That's disrespectful. Wait, there's... <laughs> there's American stuff that's British and apple pie is one of them? It don't get more, more ab American than apple pie. Put that video at the end. And if you would like to be alerted about all future videos and haven't had a chance to subscribe to this channel, do that now. In the meantime, allow me to inflate your brain with facts so beautiful they belong in the Louvre or the discount bins at Walmart. When Bounty? I first moved Bounty? to the United States all of those years ago, people would ask me, Lawrence, apart from your family and Yorkshire puddings, what do you... Bounty? miss most about Britain and my answer was always the same. British chocolate. Okay. I mean sure your average American grocery store might carry one or two Cadbury bars and mini eggs but crunches, twirls and whisper bars were a lot harder to come by. However America's confectionery aisles did contain one divisive British chocolate bar that I happen to love. Bounty. Okay fantastic. Are you gonna sit up here and tell me that the Bounty bar is from America? And you guys are just freely taking credit. Can we get some? Y'all, chocolate is 10 times better than ours, 100%. Let me let us just get that then. Stick, I can live with that, except two of the things that I just said are completely and utterly a little bit false. The Bounty, a chocolate covered coconut filled fixture of UK sweet shelves, is not actually British at all, but American. And I know what you're thinking. Ooh, Lawrence, Britain sells. That is shocking. <laughs> M&M, Snickers, and countless other American top sellers. What makes Bounty so special? And in some respects, you raise a valid point, especially since the wrapper is plastered with obviously Hawaiian imagery. You see, I always just thought that this was a product of fantastical marketing, kind of like how Britain came up with the world's most famous bears despite the total absence of bears in the... Winnie the Pooh's from the UK? Oh my God, what is happening? British Wild. Furthermore, this one is special in part because of its name, which brings me on to line number two, the truth of which is this. Americans don't call them bounties. Here, the bar is branded differently depending on whether it's light or dark chocolate, ah. with the names Almond Joy and Mounds applied. No cap. Hey, listen. I knew it was oddly similar. Almond Joy is my favorite candy. I got a bag of them in the fridge. Now nah, you think I'm lying. Hold on. Uh -uh. Oh, I knew. I knew this was too similar. So it's just branded different. Okay. 
died respectively. Both were launched in the first half of the 20th century in the United States. And it was only a few years later in 1951 that Mars Incorporated, which had no trademark attachment to the American varieties, launched Bounty in the UK and Canada as Straight Up Imitations. Wow. So y'all copied our little candy, huh? Y'all copied our little candy, huh? And I can't really say nothing about the grade of chocolate and the, and the almond joy because I this my favorite candy, 100%. Sandwiched in between the launch of these sugar-laden chocolate bars was an even bigger killer, World War Part Two. Thankfully, as an antidote to the horror and misery unfolding before them, both countries found comfort in music. Most famously, American band leader Glenn Miller was hugely popular on both sides of the Atlantic, to the tragic extent that he disappeared over the English Channel in 1944. As it happens, Britain's most lauded wartime music icon herself became synonymous with the English Channel. In addition to singing the famous World War II hit and Doctor Strange Love outro track, we'll meet again Vera Lynn soothed Britain with Vera the Lynn. equally hopeful White Cliffs of Dover. As the Luftwaffe honed in on Britain, who wouldn't have found comfort in the prophecy there'll be bluebirds over the white cliffs of dover well for one ornithologists because there are no f***ing bluebirds in britain <laughs> in fact they're entirely endemic to north america which also oh. appears to have been true of the song's lyricist after it was released new yorker nat burton insisted he didn't realize that england didn't have bluebirds still nice sentiment he just felt inspired and got to it i feel you nat if that is your real name anyway speaking of iconic anthems that brings us on to this you'll never walk a few things hey you're not gonna do this to my scouse brethren things are more british than football a sport whose origins can be traced back to ancient china really okay fine <sighs> but few things really are more british than china really don't worry though china got it a lot they got fried chicken as well something else that i thought you know what i'm saying and football chants and songs. And perhaps the most iconic anthem in the whole of English football is You'll Never Walk Alone. Appropriately, given the song's title, it is also synonymous with more than one British club, with supporters really? of both Celtic and S Liverpool oh, belting it out before kickoff. In fact, the oh, song. That makes sense. That makes sense. song is so inextricably linked to Liverpool in particular that those four words can be found on the club's badge. It is used in reference to the successful 1963 version by Jerry Andor the Pacemen. Makers. At the time, Jerry and or the Pacemakers were a popular group from Liverpool, perhaps second only to the Beatles. The auto Beatles right? I suppose the people are never going to know the identity of that other group now. And so the song and everything it represents is as Liverpudlian as Albert Dock. I didn't know the Beatles were from Liverpool until like last year. <laughs> My bad, John. But it isn't. You see, unlike the band formerly known as the Quarrymen, Jerry and or the Pacemakers did not write their first few hit singles. And this included You'll Never Walk Alone. But then you knew that if you happened to be a fan of musicals. I once played Prince Dauntless in Once Upon a Mattress, so it's a touchy subject. The piece was, in fact, the brainchild of American songwriting duo Rodgers and Hammerstein, ah. who included the track on their Broadway smash carousel. So how I have no idea who those two men are. But salute! How did it come to be an anthem for England's most trophy-laden club? Well, by 1963, Jerry Marsden, this time without his pacemakers, is said to have played a demo to Liverpool's legendary manager, Bill Shankly, who was like, that is an absolute banger, mate. Inject that sh** into my veins. Now, we haven't verified the validity of that quote, but rest assured it was along those lines. Later that year, the song... I'm very sceptical. Song, along with other chart hits of the day, made it onto the terraces of Liverpool's Anfield Stadium. And unlike those other songs, it hasn't left since. Rem wait, That's hold on, wait now. Unlike those other songs, it hasn't left since. Remembrance poppies? That's right, even the poppies that are worn by us Brits in the lead up to Remembrance Day aren't actually British. But don't take my word for it, instead, here's me from a year ago discussing it on a YouTube <laughs> short that you probably yeah. missed. Moina Michael was an American professor who pioneered the idea of commemorating soldiers with the red poppy. She'd been inspired to push for it after reading the famed poem In Flanders Fields by John McRae, himself a Canadian lieutenant colonel. While teaching a class to disabled World War I Everybody takes everything and makes it their own, man. It's, it's all right, right? 
Servicemen. That just means you want it more than the last person. At the University of Georgia, Moyna saw an opportunity to engineer financial support for the wounded by selling poppy. I would never do something like that. As a result of her efforts, the American Legion Auxiliary and the British Legion Appeal Fund both formalized the poppy as a symbol of remembrance from 1921. While Britain widely persists with the symbol more than a century later, America has long since phased out the November 11th poppy with some choosing to wear one during May's Memorial Day. Day. I'm gonna be real with you. I've never even seen the flower before, but not one time in life. Um. Thanks, past Lawrence. My neck hurts. And now, just like my mate Daz, after an hour on the beach, we go from something red to something even more red. And we're Santa? Was that Santa? Father Christmas. But Father Christmas, one of Santa's pseudonyms, while delivering presents. I knew this. In Britain, didn't always wear that particular colour. But as I said in 1987, when Santa brought me a protein pack instead of a proton pack, back up there, mate. Because who was Father Christmas actually? Well, I won't bore you with all of the details because I already did that in this video. But in a nutshell, it went like this. From English folkloric tradition, Father Christmas was indeed the personification of Christmas. Right. Historically, he went by several names, including Christmas Lord, Prince Christmas, and I'm not making this one up, Captain Christmas. But when settlers boarded ships for the New World, they didn't take Captain Christmas with them, presumably opting for an actual captain. There are two big reasons for this. Number one, 17th century Puritans in England had declared Christmas an affront to God, even banning it at one point. And number two, Puritans in New England kind of viewed things the same way. And so many Christmas traditions were shelved, including Father Christmas. But fear not, because 200 years later, with Puritan influence having long since waned, he returned. However, by the time he was revived by the Victorians, who often depicted him in green robes and a crown ordered on eBay, the US had moved <laughs> on to other things, such as the Dutch figure, Santa Claus. And at this point, you might be thinking, so... Uh, what? Oh, Santa Claus is a Dutch figure? What, Lawrence? You lied to us. All this tells us is that Father Christmas is still British. Correction, was still British because during the 19th century, word of Santa Claus reached England. People seemed to take a shine to him, and although for a while he and Father Christmas remained distinct, our version started taking on elements of that curious fellow from the North Pole. For instance, his crown disappeared and was replaced by a hood, probably also from eBay. His waist became larger and his cheeks rosier. And after- Look, is he smoking a pipe? After Santa Claus was depicted in 19th century Father Christmas got high? Cartoons wearing red and white. Father Christmas came to follow suit. I didn't intend that pun, but gosh, it was good. And so today you could argue that he remains Father Christmas in name only, hence why a lot of Brits just call him Santa Claus. Tea bags? Okay, talk to me. When you hear the word tea, there's only one country that comes to mind, Britain. Just well, actually, the Boston Tea Party, right? Realise that's three countries. Nonetheless, the British fixation with tea is very real, dating back to the 1660s when it was brought to England by Catherine of Braganza, the future Queen of England. Just over a century later, Britain was so enamoured with tea that Americans in Boston famously copied us by hosting a tea party of their own. And on a personal note... See? You know what I'm saying? Low-key, I'm, I'm a genius. I remember school... I remember what you taught me, school. <laughs> but the one thing that Americans assume most about me is that I prefer tea to coffee, which is only true if I've had three coffees. That said, British people do generally love their tea, whereas Americans, more often than not, are indifferent. Instead, the latter love their lattes. And so it will surprise absolutely everybody to learn that tea bags were invented not in Britain, but Milwaukee. The first patent. Ah, Milwaukee, my neighbor. Okay. I mean, Milwaukee, for sure, give them something, because they really don't got no identity. So, yeah, I guess. Or patent, if you will, was filed in that city in 1903 by its inventors, Roberta Lawson and Mary McLaren. Within five years, their idea Very caught rich. the attention mm -hmm. of New York importer Thomas Sullivan, who subsequently had them shipped around the world. The tea bags, not the inventors. Today, tea bags are a common household item in Britain, but Yorkshire tea, which is manufactured 80 miles from my English hometown, owes everything to two people 80 miles from this one. 
Behold US Patent Patent 723287, the tea leaf holder. Is that what it's called? Tea bag, huh? They do a lot of that in Call of Duty. And so, if I've learned anything from this two-part series, it is that both of my homelands have a rich history of influencing each other. In many ways, our special relationship feels more like one of siblings. We might squabble from time to time, but it's only because we can't stand each other. Soon, I'll be looking at recent words that Britain took from America and vice versa. In the meantime, if you haven't seen it yet, here are six American things that are actually British. So watch that video now. Thanks, man. You inspired me to watch this by your thumbnail, and I've taken a real liking to you as a human being. You do great work, and 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 you you really educated me here. Thank you. Tell her, leave a like, comment, subscribe, turn on your post notification bell. And if anybody in the UK is watching this, if you need us to to, to lend you anything else, let me know.